Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. We'll get started soon. So happy you could join us. Hello, everybody. As you're joining us, why don't you type your name and your organization, where you're Zooming in from, so we can got, start getting a sense of where you're coming from. And we'll be starting it in just a little bit, letting people join right now. Nashville, look at all these, South Carolina, Florida, Minneapolis. Let's see, oh, 10 strands I saw, Connecticut. We have Canada, Minnesota, Puerto Rico, hello. This is great. And it looks like we'll get started in one more minute. One more cartoon for everybody. And again, just let us know where you're coming from. Asheville, Michigan. Idaho, California, so great to see all of you. Welcome. Bulgaria, Massachusetts, the Houston Zoo. Hello, Nova Scotia, wonderful. Joe from AmeriCorps, wonderful. And uh, Stacy, thanks for liking the cartoons, love it. Okay, everybody, I think we are going to get started here. So hello and welcome to our webinar today. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Judy Browse and I'm the Executive Director of the North American Association for Environmental Education. I really think you're in for a treat today and, and are gonna enjoy not only our speaker, but our volunteers who will be taking part at the end in a nice discussion. And it's all about how to communicate like a leader and the seven guidelines for a, creating a story of disruption. So today we are gonna focus on looking at the link between communication, storytelling and leadership. And we're assuming everyone here is a leader and doing so many things around leadership and around communication, around storytelling during this really tough time. And we're all trying to make our way through this very uncertain crisis. And so many of you have asked about, what is it okay to say? What should I be doing during this crisis? How do I talk about what we're doing? And communication has risen as one of the key questions that we keep getting about how do we communicate with each other with about our organization, about our field during this time. And here are just a few of the questions that you have sent in. Things like, how do we talk about um, our field and our communities when so much is happening in the world and what's our you know, relevance to what's happening to the world? Why is storytelling important now? How do we handle all these fiscal pressures and everything that follows from that? Some of you are getting a ton of demand and you have less staff and support. You're asking about strategies for now, but then what happens as we kind of start opening and then what happens later and how do we get ready? You've asked questions about, can we use COVID as a platform to talk about EE in general, about other issues, about things that you know are on your plate. And we have gotten so much about how to keep morale up and hope up during this crisis and especially when so many of us are dealing with issues that we feel are even gonna be worse than this pandemic with climate change, loss of biodiversity, systemic inequities and all of that. And that's what we've been hearing from all of you. So luckily today we have Michael Margolis who's gonna help us with all of these really, really tough issues. And Michael, I'll introduce you in a second. Um, and first just wanna do a little intro to make sure everybody knows how to use the system and to just say that these webinars that we've been doing are ways to actually bring new ideas, new ways of looking at our work during this crisis and beyond. 
Um, a number of the webinars are going to focus directly on COVID and how we cope, and some are going to be about the field and bringing new ideas to the field. And so our next webinar is on May 5th next week and all about looking at the Latino community and how Corazon Latino is doing their work in this time of COVID and how we can all do better in terms of engaging the Latino community. So that's another one to look forward to soon. And I do want to thank all of our affiliate co-hosts who are part of all of this and helping to not only get the word out, but also helping to advance environmental education and asking these same questions about their own organization and helping to support all the educators in their states, provinces, and regional areas. And we do know that you have been on a zillion um, Zoom calls and many of you actually don't use Zoom, you use other platforms. So we always wanna give a quick intro on how to communicate because everybody is muted and we can't see any of you, but we know you're there. The way to communicate is at the, in the chat room and you can either send a question to all of us as panelists or to everyone. And we encourage you throughout when you're listening to Michael and the questions to not only put your questions in the chat, but also any resources that you might have that you think would be helpful to others. And everybody will get a copy of the slides, they'll get a copy of the recording, and they'll get a copy of the chat. So don't worry about trying to take notes throughout. We also wanted to let you know that we will be captioning the recording for anyone who has trouble with the audio, and that'll be coming out when we send it out. And then a quick thank you to Anne, um, who is our webinar guru and has done so much in terms of building our professional development in the field. And she's the manager of EE360. If you have any issues, please email her directly in the chat box. And then this time we've got five other panelists who are gonna take part in the discussion. So thanks to all of you for joining in. Um, I think it's gonna be really engaging and a good discussion because we all have a lot of the same issues. So thank you all. And now I am so excited to introduce Michael Margolis. He is absolutely one of the most creative storytelling gurus in the country, in the world probably. And he's been a friend and colleague for many years and has helped NAA and so many others think more creatively about strategically telling our story. He's the CEO and founder of Storied, a strategic messaging firm that's all about the story of innovation and disruption. He says he goes anywhere there's a story worth telling, and he has worked with hundreds of organizations, agencies, and individual leaders, especially in Silicon Valley, the Fortune 500s, and groups like us that, and all of you who are on the call who are trying to create global change. He's a frequent keynote speaker at conferences around the world when we used to have conferences, and he's also a two-time TEDx speaker. He's trained tens of thousands on narrative intelligence and how to build storytelling as organizational capacity. Since 2002, he's advised clients across 34 industries, 15 countries, including Facebook, Google, Hulu, Uber, Greenpeace, NASA, and so many others. And he also is a number one Amazon best-selling author. And his work has been prominently featured in a number of places like Fast Company and Time and Inc. My favorite part of his bio is that he says he is left-handed, he's colorblind, and he eats more chocolate than the average human. And his latest book, which is up here on the screen, Story 10 Times, Turn the Impossible into the Inevitable, is now available, and two of you are gonna be lucky enough to get a copy. So now, Michael, welcome. Let's give him a virtual warm welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Judy, and um, thanks everyone for joining us. Let me uh, get my screen share going. I think we just need to un, un uh, we got to swap out this um, this screen. Okay, great. All right, here we go. Okay. All right. So let's let's dive into this and um, let's start with the following, which is things are moving so fast, people don't know what story they're in anymore, and you know, this is something we've been talking about for years. Uh, our work is specifically around storytelling for disruption and innovation. It's why we spend so much time in Silicon Valley, but working with, with change makers across industries. 
So things have been moving so fast. We don't know what story we're in anymore. And now here comes COVID. And now we really don't know what story we're in anymore. And so we're going to unpack this a little bit today. I'm going to give you some frameworks and tools, uh, ways of navigating. How do you tell the story of where you are, where you want to be going, and where you're coming from? And some of the inherent creative tensions uh, in, in how do we meet this moment? Okay, so... Uh, some people might be familiar with storytelling in the context of the hero's journey. I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, huge fan of, of Joseph Campbell, but my use and work of the hero's journey goes only about as far as the following. So this is the hero's journey in a time of COVID. Um, and how are we going to go out and get the groceries? Um, so, you know, we've all, we're all familiar with this general journey of, you know, the call to adventure and finding our helpers. And you guys can find this um, on my LinkedIn if you guys want to want to want to share this wonderful meme. I, I share this jokingly, um, but actually there's one thing on this slide that I think is really relevant for us. Because, by the way, you can't take the hero's journey and just simply drag and drop that into an organizational or business setting yep. um, without it um, really, really, really being able to translate for folks. I'm noticing, and Michael, by the way, yeah, the slides, the slides aren't, aren't, they're not, they're oh. not uh, moving forward. So try again, just like, hit oh, for on it some reason it says here, oh, one second. Um, it says that, there you go. Yeah, but for some reason, why did, one second, let me try again. Thanks for calling that out, everyone. There we go. How about that? Perfect. Okay. All right. Now you guys can actually follow along and get the joke. All right. There's nothing worse <laughs> than delivering a joke that has no punchline. Um, so, so here's, here's, here's the infamous meme. But the thing I do want to point out about the hero's journey that is relevant for us, it's this distinction between the known and the unknown. What's certain versus uncertain. And part of the challenge of this time right now is how do you tell a story about the future when we don't have visibility or line of sight yet on what comes next? Maybe we're starting to get inklings of this, but it's a very challenging environment as a leader where we like to talk about what we know, what we can count on, right? So how do we give people reassurance? How do we give people clarity when so much of the journey ahead of us is about the unknown? Okay, so beyond the joke, we're going we're gonna to unpack this a little bit. Now, when we talk about disruption, the first thing we have to make peace with is that the old reality no longer exists. All of the things that we might have cherished about the old reality and the old story may not hold true like it did before. And so I'm curious, we're going we're gonna, to uh, share out a poll right now. I'm curious to know where are you on the curve? Because each of us are on our own individual journey as, as individuals and as organizations. Um, many of us experienced having to simply be in triage and stopping the bleeding. And you may still be in that place. Or you might be a little further along and you're holding on for now. But geez, in another 30, 60 days, things might get really rough. Um, or you might be in a place where disruption is your middle name. You're like, bring it on. And some of you might even be responding to surge demand. So take a moment right now and just choose which of these best describes where are you on the curve. And what we're going to share today is going to speak to each of you, no matter where you are on that journey. Um, and the reality is we're all going to be riding waves on this journey um, as we go through continued waves of disruption. So let's see. We'll give everyone another 10 seconds or so. Just make a quick choice. Does everyone see those can poll everybody? options? Responses are coming in, but they're starting to slow down. So I can go ahead and end the poll, Michael. Okay. Share the results with everybody. All right. Mm, okay. So a lot of you guys are holding on for now. Okay. So um, that's very real. And I think a really, a really wonderful sober recognition. So with that, let's Let's, um, can you, let's close these results for a second and I'll keep moving here. So here's one way to start mapping out uh, the story of where you are. Oh, why is my slide not, still not advancing? 
I was just going to ask you if we don't the sharing the is off, journey. Bring your shared window to the front. Why does that keep doing that? Let me try to just quit another thousand things. I don't know why it's acting this way. One of the wonderful things about Zoom and virtual environments is you have to prepare and anticipate that things are not going to go perfectly right. Um, and part of this is actually a really great lesson and message to this, which is about how do we meet the moment, right? So meeting the moment, um, you know, this is what so many of us have had to do over the last couple months, right? Which is we've been in triage. And, uh, right, and we've had to meet the moment with sobriety and empathy. Um, it also requires um, business continuity and stability. And for some reason, why is my, sh I keep having this. Let me see if I can. And, and Michael, if you want to yep. send it to us, we can, we can advance it and you could just say that. Well, you know what, Danielle, do you want to maybe try? Um, since you've got, you've got the she's latest. Gonna, she's going to share the deck now. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I'm having difficulties. It may be with this latest Zoom update, which I don't think I've actually done. Maybe that's why it's acting funny. Uh, all right. We'll give Danielle a second here. Um, so anyways, as we're waiting for the slides to come up, I'll just keep, keep talking a bit here, which is, we, uh, and let's go to the slide that fo that's focused on the present. Um, oh, you're in a presentation mode, Danielle. It's showing both the current and the next slide. Um, but so you wanna think about these three stories of the past, the present, and the future, right? So the present is about meeting the moment and we have to do it right now with sobriety and having to face and confront things we never would have imagined before. And then we also have to do it with empathy, with compassion, recognizing that we have employees who may be struggling and suffering. We have constituencies that may be hurting, um, as well as the fiscal future of your own organization that's, that may be really on the line. So there's a lot of different things. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so that's the meeting the present. Okay. And we've all had to do that. And some of you guys who are holding on for now are still dealing with a lot of this current phase, this story. Now, if we go to the next slide, though, as we shift to the future, right, the future is being able to convey what's next. And the challenge, of course, is we don't have full line of sight or visibility yet. What is that future going to look like? especially for many of you who um, the environmental education work that you do is so place-based that has a physical component. And we're all experimenting with what's going to happen with shelter at home. And as people start to venture back out and what is the new normal, and it's going to require a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation, flexibility, experimentation. How do we talk about this? What's critical, though, is even in the face of the uncertainty, is we have to orient people to what comes next. If we only talk about the present, or if, furthermore, if we go to the past, um, and if we just tell the, on the next slide here the story of just the past, we get stuck, right? We hold on to, in the case of the past, there are old assumptions that we have that's a previous understanding of a reality that no longer is true. So the present and the past really matter, but what's critical, the way you're gonna give your people and your constituents and your funders faith in the future is by giving them a story of what's coming next. Okay? So we're gonna spend a lot of time today looking at how to meet the present moment, right? And then how to shift into the future. Um, in telling that story. So let's go to that slide in the, ch in the chat uh, about your assumptions. So one of the things that's helpful to name is I want you all to take one moment right now, or uh, one minute, and what are one or two assumptions about your business, or in your case, your organization, that no longer hold true? Because remember, the stories that we tell 
are usually built upon a set of assumptions. And one of the biggest challenges to disruption and change is we keep telling a story for a world that no longer exists, or we keep telling a story based on a set of assumptions that are no longer true. So it's really helpful as part of this process to take an inventory, what assumptions no longer are valid. Um, and I'm seeing some great things come up here. So most jobs need to be done in the office, kids attending field trips. Yeah, it seems like a really big one, just as I'm seeing, looking at the chat here, is, you know, for many, many of us um, who do work that is place-based, that's physical environment, um, where you're, you know, many of you have had a mission about let's make sure we're getting kids or adults out into nature. And from that perspective, it's also easy to say, ah, oh, we're spending too much time on screens and technology's terrible. And it's the reason why, you know, civilization, all of its discontents, um, what we're learning right now is actually, wow, maybe it's not so black and white. Maybe technology has a role and a place um, to actually close the distance and bring us closer together. Um, and that there are new ways of how we look at the world and how we look at how we relate and connect with each other that is coming out of COVID. Um, so this is great. I love the assumptions um, that you guys are typing in the chat and please continue to do those right now as we keep moving forward. Um, so let's go to the next slide here. So here's a really important call to arms for all of you, even in the face of all of this uncertainty right now. If you're not telling the story, someone else is gonna tell it for you. Let that sink in for a moment. If you're not telling the story, someone else is gonna tell it for you. And this is one of the challenges um, where we have to learn to control the narrative. Because if we create a vacuum or a void, people will naturally fill it. We as human beings are story-making machines. And so as an organizational leadership, you want to be communicating with people so that you're narrating the journey um, and, and helping people to orient because otherwise our natural story-making sort of function, we fill it with all sorts of stories. And oftentimes those stories aren't accurate. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about actually is some of the new science of story. Uh, and forgive the shameless product placement, you can learn a lot more about this in my new book, Story 10X. Um, chapter three specifically goes into the new science of story. And one of the great insights is that there are two hormones that are activated when we take in a story, cortisol and oxytocin. Cortisol is the hormone that's the stress hormone, fight, flight, or freeze. Now in contrast, oxytocin is the belonging molecule. It's literally that which binds us together, reinforces our sense of connection. So in a certain way, we want to be aware that when we put out a message that produces cortisol, which unfortunately is what many of us have been taught in the nonprofit sector. I started my career in the nonprofit world, um, working on the digital divide, working on poverty and race back in the late 90s. And I saw that so many of the stories we're taught to tell are about guilt, shame, moralizing, self-righteousness, pity. We tell these stories that make people feel bad, that put people into a cortisol state. And yes, it's true. Oftentimes we're dealing with issues that have urgency and we're dealing with crisis and we have to marshal our people and our constituents. Cortisol has a place in the story, but be careful about overloading your audience with too much cortisol because then we tend to exit out of the story. And oftentimes we're not actually increasing oxytocin, right? Which is that feeling of, wow, we're in this together right? We are friends, not foes. Um, and so I'm fascinated with the distinctions of how we build narratives that increase and elevate oxytocin and decrease cortisol. Because let's be honest, we're living in a time and an age, we have plenty of divisiveness. 
we have increased political discourse uh, that is putting people on oppositional sides. That is not a scalable or sustainable story to tell. So with that in mind, um, let's, let's continue forward. I love this quote from Steve Jobs, who reminds us the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. So the stories that we tell have inordinate influence on people, right? And the question becomes, are we telling the right story for the future we want to create? This is why some of these elements of cortisol and oxytocin are so important. Now, I wanted to share with all of you today, um, actually, the family motto that I grew up with, because uh, I, I love spending time with educators. It's part of how Judy and I connected, I think, over a decade now, Judy, when you yeah. were at National Audubon Society and work we did back then. Um, and this was literally the motto growing up um, in my household, because my mother is an educator. She's a teacher, an artist, and a toy designer. And my father is a mad scientist and inventor. <laughs> so I never knew growing up whether my day would be an art project or a science experiment. So getting a chance to connect with all of you um, in the environmental education work you're doing is, is a place of deep passion. So this was literally the motto on the wall, right? Our home is an exploratorium. There are no rules on what or how to create. There's no one saying you can't do that. It's too crazy or we already tried that before. There's only imagination, the everyday materials of life, and our willingness to explore them, right? This is how I grew up. Um, and so perhaps this helps to explain, right, the kind of the, there's a method to the madness. I'm wired for disruption, for innovation in the creative process. But for all the creative freedom that my parents gave me, they never taught me how to fit in or belong anywhere. And in turn, um, I became fascinated with how to tell the story of innovation and disruption. So many of us who are leading change, we feel lost in translation. We feel misunderstood. We don't understand why our ideas and our message isn't getting through and connecting with people. This is what got me obsessed with this work now over 20 years. Um, and uh, if you look at our next slide here, this is just the range of work that we've done in those 20 years from everybody from Google and Facebook and Uber to Greenpeace and the UN Foundation, NASA science education projects. Um, one thing on here that's not listed, but I think one you guys will all appreciate and Danielle um, will share in the text chat right now. We spent several years working on a sectoral initiative on the future of public libraries uh, and did work all across the country, how to talk about the role and value of the public library in the 21st century. And we published actually a storytelling toolkit for library leaders um, that is under Creative Commons. Um, so we'll share that for you right now. You can download it, it's a PDF. I think it's about 25 pages or so, maybe about three or four years, uh, probably about four or five years old now, but as, as a great resource um, for all of you to, um, to work with. Okay, that so- That link will be coming from, from Bree in the chat, Michael. So oh, everyone perfect. look for okay. a comment. So Bree, our content strategist, is sharing that for all of you in the chat. Um, so feel free to download that and you can share that out with people. Okay, so this is a range of kind of how we apply our work. Everything from vision and strategy to uh, we've helped organizations with investor pitches and fundraising to the internal messages for all hands meetings, culture work, recruiting, and the like. Okay, so let's dive into now um, these seven recommendations, and we're going to go fast through the first few because I really want to make sure we get to the last couple that are going to really support you with the stepping stones in making the pivot. Um, and how are you going to extend um, and, and really keep moving forward at a time of, of so many challenges? Uh, Danielle, let's go one slide back. Um, and I just want to share, uh, yeah, this Maya Angelou quote. So, at the end of the day, with whatever ideas and recommendations or guidelines I share with you, if nothing else, just remember this, right? People won't remember what you said or what you did. They'll remember how you made them feel. That's why elevating oxytocin and reducing cortisol is so important. It's why we want to strengthen those connections, that sense of resonance and rapport we have with people. All right, so with that, let's move to recommendation number one, giving people reassurance. So with that, um, 
let's, let's talk about what does that mean? It means starting with the positives, right? How are you reinforcing your faith in the future? And I realize some of you may be looking at huge fiscal deficits, having to lay off or furlough employees, um, having to really stretch and ask funders, investors, constituents to support in ways you've never had to before. Even in the face of all of that, where is your conviction about your team's resilience about why what you do matters more than ever. What do you believe are the sort of the unique aspects of what is in the DNA of your organization or the role that you play in your community that is everlasting or that is essential? It's important to remind people of this because that's what's gonna give people that sense of resilience in how you meet the moment in all of its challenges and difficulties. Number two, uh, empathize with people's realities. And so what does that mean? Um, you know, this is a challenge, and, and I know many of you care deeply about your employees and the constituents that you serve, yet we, we all can in, invariably have blind spots as leaders where we take for granted all the things that we see that our own employees or constituents or donors that we assume that they see everything else that we see. And that's why as leaders, we have to narrate the story and read them into what's happening. We also have to remember that while those of us who identify as change agents, we may really like change and embrace change and hey, disruption's your middle name. But remember that people do not like change that they're not in control of. And while you might be dealing with a big giant pile of suck, you have more control and agency, a sense of self-determination right now than many of your people on the ground, right? You're influencing the decisions that are being made, whereas other people are at the effect of the decisions that will be made. So how do we demonstrate our sense and, and appreciation, that empathy for the vulnerability that people are feeling. How can you communicate that? Um, and think about in what ways can you be generous to others? The things that might be a marginal cost of delivery. Like we have this storytelling toolkit, it's under Creative Commons. So feel free to share that. Like what are the things that are easy to share with people? Okay, number three. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And really the critical one here, one of the things that we've learned ourselves is doing things like daily stand-ups. 15 minutes every morning is not to underestimate because there's so much change in flux that people probably want and need to hear from you more frequently than they ever have before. How can you increase the cadence of your communications and let people know, here's what we know, here's what's certain, here's what we don't know, here's what we're figuring out, right? And here's what are our next steps are, here's what's happening in the short term. Okay, number four, mitigate fear as much as risk. Fear is the mind killer. This goes back to cortisol and oxytocin. So while cortisol is great at an immediate initial response to threat, cortisol also leads to burnout and cortisol leads to panic or irrational decision-making. Cortisol is what separates and divides. So you want to be really thinking about how are you bringing people together, right? In what ways are you reinforcing those binds or bonds of connection? All right, we're going to keep moving through because you'll see as we get to the, to the next few here, we're going to really, really get into some deep, juicy stuff. Um, and by the way, these seven guiding principles are also summarized, at least the first five are written up in an article um, that we'll also put in the text chat for you that you can read on LinkedIn. Okay, number five, um, real simple principle, language is power. And so celebrate in this time right now what's possible. What is the inherent potential and promise of this moment? What are the opportunities in, for, in front of us? Because let's be honest, as a culture, we're obsessed 
with what's wrong, with what's broken and what needs to be fixed. Yet when we tell a story about what's wrong or what's broken or what needs to be fixed, we forget that often our audience is complicit if not responsible in that problem. This is why we face so much resistance. This is why we come up against so many of the challenges and the pushback, the oppositional divisiveness that comes with traditional activism or change making. And so I want to encourage you, and in the book, we go in much greater detail of the, on this. Um, I'm also going to give you some specific next steps we're going to get into now with number six in how to name the future in a way that unlocks celebrating the promise and the potential in ways that are going to grab people's imagination and get people emotionally invested to go on that journey. And then we're going to do some, and, some live coaching with yeah. folks and kind of unpack and, this a little bit more. Yeah. And Michael, one quick thing. Um, Sarah yeah. asked if you could just say a little bit more about what is a daily standup? What, oh, what did sure. you mean by that? So a daily standup is really just, um, is, is a simple, uh, it's a very simple management practice. Um, you can do this virtually on Zoom where you just, it's like a, it's like a team huddle. You know, the idea of a standup is it should be a short enough meeting that everybody could literally be standing in the midst of it. And it's just a quick check-in of, hey, each team member, what are your three prior top priorities today? And it's just that sense of like, we're all putting our head in the game. We're all checking in, getting a sense of where we're each at. Do we need to do any sidebar meetings? Um, yeah, like I, I, Katrina mentioned, you do, one, you do those one time a week. And we do team meetings also on a weekly basis. Many people do. With the disruptions of COVID, with work from home, with all of these new unfamiliar territories, do not underestimate the power of a quick daily stand-up. It's kind of like, okay, let's all get our head in the game. Let's all have that moment of oxytocin, connection, cohesion. We're in it together. Um, and, and then also identify, are there any sidebar meetings or other things that, that we then need to check in on because things are so fluid and moving so fast. Okay. All right. Um, so with that, let's now move to number six here, naming the future. All right, so this is really a juicy one, and um, you may want to even take a, if there's one thing you want to sort of take a snapshot of or, or write down, and obviously we'll share these slides out, um, but these are five different ways, strategies. How do you start naming the future, even in this time of uncertainty? So number one, what remains the same? What are some of the enduring truths, no matter what, that still stand up, even in the face of all of this change? Number two, how do you talk about your work as essential and must have? Let's be honest. We've all gone through our P&Ls and our budgets over the last couple months and asked ourselves, do we really need to spend this money? Do we really need to focus on this activity? Do we really need this and that? We've all done it in our individual lives. We're all doing it in our own organizations. So the job and task for each of us is to frame our work as essential and must have. How do you do that, right? So we'll unpack that a little bit um, in some of the Q&A. Number three is you may wanna shift or need to shift your focus in terms of audiences or constituencies, right? We've experienced a surge in demand for our services in the last few weeks after you know, going through massive disruption and seeing 90% of loss of income within our business um, when, when COVID first happened. But the surge in demand is coming from specific industries that they, they themselves are having surge, like big tech, like pharma, um, right? And people who are working on the clinical trials, for instance, for the vaccines against COVID and so on. All right, um, last, last couple points here. Number four, emergence. This is one of my favorites. It's a big idea, though, and it's based on a quote that a friend of mine, David Logan, wrote the book Tribal Le Leadership, shared with me, is um, a prophet describes the inevitability of values-based change. Let me say that again. A prophet is simply someone who describes the inevitability of values-based change. What does that mean? What are some of the underlying values in our culture, right? And 
that are seeking wider expression. So right now, for instance, one of the values in our culture in how we do work is employees want more transparency, right? We live in an age of we want our leaders to share more information with us. So that's a value that you can bank on. And if you can respond to that value, your employees will be really happy, right? Similarly, uh, right, Whole Foods recognized 20 years ago, people wanted to know where their food comes from and how it's made. That value, right, is what led to the growth of the organic and natural foods industry. Um, Harley Davidson is about freedom. Apple is about creative expression and understanding that technology is emotional, right? So think about in your own work, what are the underlying values that people are seeking to express by coming to one of your programs? Or similarly, what are one of the underlying values that one of your donors is seeking to express in the world? And when they give you their money, they are giving you their money so that you can go and express that value out into the world, right? And bring it to life. Values are a really important drivetrain of the stories that people buy into. And then lastly, what's possible now that wasn't before, right? What are the new vectors that emerge through all of these disruptions and change? Um, okay, with that, um, oh, I've got one last one here. Everyone is a leader. Um, and just this simple idea that this is a time to democratize and distribute your leadership, right? Of actually giving up control, inviting more people to tell the story, let people alongside you lead, invite your donors to help you problem solve, invite your community members, right? Like how do you tap into uh, and increasing your bandwidth of resources? And part of this is, is, is about being vulnerable, hey, we don't have all the answers. How can you invite people into helping to create that future with you? Okay, um, let's actually go into some Q and A because I know we've got lots of territory that we can um, that we can that we can get to here. So um, I know that was a lot to get through, um, but let's let's open it up and maybe we'll take from. Why don't we start with just one of the panelists um, who've joined us? So if you all would want to put on your video, Sheila, Kirkan, Katie, Melissa, and if anybody has a question, this is a good time. Yeah, and what I'd love to do in these questions is we're, we'll, we're going to take a, have a chance to take some of these principles and really apply them and um, sort of bring them to life, color them through the lens of various members of, of NAAEE. -E. Okay. So um, who would like to, uh, to share a thought, question, comment? Uh, this is Sheila. I can Hi, Sheila. Hi, uh, I have a question. So I've been yeah. thinking about how to convey this, like looking towards the future, how to convey what's next uh, and really focusing on our mission yeah. when so much is changing day to day. And so I work um, in teacher education and yep. teaching future teachers, and we don't even know if we'll be teaching in person. Um, can we start classes online? Um, how do you convey some confidence uh, and hope in that? Absolutely. Well, so this is a great question. Um, and so the, the, the first thing, Sheila, is, um, you know, despite all of these disruptions and unknowns, would it be fair to say that parents appreciate the roles of teachers and educators today more, more than they did 60 days ago or 90 days ago? Absolutely. I think they are having a better understanding for what the uh, early childhood day is like. <laughs> right. So, so this is an example of like thinking about in the last, you know, through this COVID disruption, what are ways that people are now closer to your story where people might appreciate and value what you do from a new vantage point? And how might you now tap into that greater appreciation that parents have, including also the pain and overwhelm that they've had of, of homeschooling or figuring out um, you know, childcare and all these other sorts of issues. How might you be able to draw them into your work and what comes next? Right. right. Um, 
Yeah, we have go ahead. started to do uh, a couple of nights for families to just check in with each other. Mm -hmm. And we've started to, they've been evolving. And so we're actually having one tonight. It's after the kids go to bed. Uh, we're going to do one breakout session about how are you dealing with right now and one breakout session about what are you worried about for the future, like preparing your child for kindergarten or uh, thinking about, you know, how would they retransition into a classroom environment if they have been really flourishing um, in this kind of one on one environment at home. So we've been thinking about those things and trying to support families through that. And I agree with you. It's been great to link them in uh, to help give them some resources and tools. Um, and they, we miss them and they miss us. So that's been pretty great to, to see. I, I love what you just shared, Sheila. And one of the things that, um, you know, I learned from my mother as a teacher, and I'm sure you have a perspective of this and many of you listening do as well, which is, you know, I think, I think one of the key principles as a teacher is you learn that like, you have to like meet every student where they're at. Like every student is different. Every student has got different passions and interests. Every student has different sort of growth edges and, and challenges. And I think there's an opportunity as an educator community to also reassure parents right now that while education may not look like what it used to, to reassure them that actually, you know what, kids are getting everything they need right now like sort of the like making peace with the moment that, that, you know, like in recognizing that there are, there are new things that, that kids are learning around resilience, around adaptation, around self-direction. Um, there's also new things that parents are learning around letting go of perfectionism or that like everything's got to be just a certain way. So I would, I would really encourage for all of you reinforcing these values of like, how do we just meet the moment and normalize that, you know what, Th things may actually be, be okay, even though they look different than what we've, how we've had it before. Like whatever your own personal philosophy or approach to that is, but I think reassurance is a really important message that parents and families need right now um, in ways as educators that we can help them recognize the there's all sorts of new ways of learning that kids and families are getting right now and to celebrate and embrace that. Does that help Sheila? Yes, thank you. That was great. Wonderful. Let's hear from someone else. Hi, Michael. Oh, Hi. did you want to go quick in? Go for it. No, you go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Michael. I'm Melissa Taggart from NAAEE. So I'm part of the team that is helping with this webinar. Yep. Um, so we, we are kind of the, you know, professional development, uh, we're an association for environmental educators. We are, we call ourselves often the backbone organization for the field of environmental education. And a big part of what we do is, is provide service to, you know, our field. We're like a network of networks. We have our affiliates, we have our many different networks. Um, and of course, I think our work is, is incredibly valuable, but down the road, as this, you know, the economic impacts of COVID continue, um, I worry about continuing to convey the value of the work that we do in a way that really resonates, but also being sensitive to the fact that the world has changed and people are really suffering. And, and how do you balance that and not be tone deaf and also, you know, and, and also kind of continue to maintain, convey your value in a way that can resonate? That's a great question, Melissa. And I think part of this for us as leaders is, is learning how to become more comfortable with the context shifting. It's like there's multiple stories we have to live in and we have to keep switching back and forth from them, right? So one story is like meeting the moment and that requires sobriety and compassion for what may be really difficult, bloody circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. Another piece of this is hey, celebrating the moment of, look, while we, not, we may not be able to deliver things in the ordinary ways that we, were, that we all typically do, we can mm -hmm. adapt. And we're educators, like it's all about working with the materials that we have to work with and the creative yeah. ways of doing like, you know, virtual based learning and other kinds of things and, and sort of like, hey, let's celebrate the gift of that. And then there's another story, Melissa, which is the, you know, 
in a, in a, as people are starting to come out of shelter from home, you're going to see this boomerang where you've never seen more people who just simply can't wait to hug a freaking tree, right? <laughs> And to sit in the park and I'm one of them. <laughs> go out and you're going to see this huge boomerang of, oh my God, the green, green spaces and, and right. Cause everybody's cooped up. So mm -hmm. it's like, we have to recognize there's like these, it's almost like a kaleidoscope of these different or a prism of these different perspectives. Right. Yeah. And you want to just keep orienting both in this present moment. And as you look forward, like, What's the pot, what's sort of the silver lining in each of these situations while also, you know, showing compassion and being sober about, yeah, this is, this right now sucks. This right now, th this is what we don't know. This is what we need to figure out all of these uncertainties. Um, but I, I do think this is a moment for the environmental education world where the, the fundamental value of what you do is going to be understood and recognized more than ever. Um, mm -hmm. Or for the work that you guys are all doing more broadly on climate change, for instance, I think COVID really is a is is a moment of phase level shift in collective consciousness, like at a society global level of our interconnectedness, our interdependence, our inter like our vulnerabilities, right? And um, and and you're seeing this like, wow, wait. Wow, what, what, what is our social contract? Um, how, how do we take care of each other? How do we take care of our place and where we live and the people who live in it? Um, and I think over the next few years, there's gonna be a huge referendum on our relationship to the world around us. Um, and I think that, 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 you know, that the NAAEE has an incredible opportunity to contribute to that bigger conversation. Um, so that's, that, that's what kind of gets me excited. But I think the key is, is to, Melissa, is, is to figure out for you and for any, like any of you, is w where do you get excited? Where do you have hope? What are the glimmers? What are the things that you think are intriguing and, 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 and orient people's frames of mind and the stories we tell around that? Kirk Ann, did you have a question? Yes, I guess my question is sort of a, a broad question, yeah. but um, I work with an organization, Ten Strands, which is in California, um, and a lot of the work that we do, or some of the work we do anyway, is on, on the statewide policy level and trying to advocate for the inclusion of environmental literacy in public schools yeah. and funding to support it, and of course, that's changed very quickly, the legislative cycle this year. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how to kind of rise above the noise and make sure that whatever happens as the system kind of gets reimagined in the near term and into the fall, um, how do we, you know, rise above the fray and um, really connect in a way that's relevant so that we're a part of um, an environmental education as a part of what emerges from all of this? Yes. A big question. Great. I, I love it. And here, here, so a few quick answers to this. Number one, make it a love story. Um, and I'll give you a few examples of this. You know, in our work with public libraries, and many of you, you know, are adjacent or even may have libraries as part of your facilities. You know, this was a story about what's the role and value of the public library in the 21st century. And we built an overarching narrative there you know, across the sector that was about when you step into a library, your world just got bigger. And then we created use cases. We highlighted the 21st century library is a place where um, it's, a, it's an engine for economic development. Um, it's, a, it's an incubator within the community. It's, it's one of the few non-commercial, non-denominational gathering places in the community. It's an undervalued, underutilized community asset. It's like you want to, so you want to, you want to celebrate the inherent goodness of what you're doing in a way people go, you know, I never thought about it that way. Um, another example, we did work years ago for NASA science education, um, specifically NASA Explorer schools. And at a time when $30 million program was on the budget chopping block. And that narrative was built on the idea that everybody dreams. Right, because NASA, it's you know, it's 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 the story of some of the greatest scientific achievements of the 20th century, 
and they were trying to preserve this education program for middle schools on Capitol Hill where they were being caught in sort of the bureaucratic policy and political side of stuff. So we told a story in a campaign that went back to NASA's origin story, right? Of like looking up to the sky and imagining, you know, possibilities and then reminding them of how, like there's nothing that like excites a kid more than learning, um, you know, basically it's using NASA as the curriculum for learning about science and math and reminding people who these decision makers who were in their baby, you know, these were baby boomers, reminding them back to the NASA origin story and how this was helping to prepare the next generation of scientists and engineers and so on. So like, there's a way where we kind of have to get creative of like, what's the bigger story and kind of bring people back into that. Um, so I would encourage, encourage you all to be thinking the same at the policy level. This isn't about what's wrong or broken, but rather celebrate the possibilities and the inherent goodness um, in a way that can make others look good and feel good. That's how you get policymakers and business leaders on your side. Great, and, thank you. And Michael, we, we're at about five till, and I wondered if okay. Katie had a question yes. and then we could go into the ending and then Michael has been very generous to say he would stay on for a few minutes and after school to answer a few additional questions. So yeah, Katie, absolutely. not to put you on the spot, but do you have our uh, maybe a final question? Because we have a couple of others in the chat room. Great. Um, so my name is Katie Navin. I'm the director of the Colorado Alliance for Environmental Education. We are very similar. We're an affiliate of NAAAA. So we are the association at the state level. Um, my biggest concern right now is yeah. that come fall, yep. um, there's going to be a lot of challenges in terms of schools that have lost instructional time and think they don't have time for field trips yep. or think that they, there are just a million more challenges to taking field trips in a safe way. And how do we start to send the message that this type of learning is still important? Yeah. Love it, Katie. Well, um, I mean, I would, I would go back and double down on everybody's been in lockdown and cooped up and, 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 um, and there's that, and, and with that too, um, you know, that we're all dealing with morale issues. So how can a field, you know, we all know, I mean, we remember when we were in school, like field trips were like the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know, or like pizza in the lunchroom. I mean, so field trips is something that kids really look forward to and teachers are also overwhelmed with all of the changes that are going to be happening. So how can you position and talk about a field trip as a respite and also as, um, as a way of reconnecting and re-energizing, um, you know, and, and all the ways where, you know, we've all been kind of cooped up and, you know, everybody's having kind of their, um, uh, you know, sort of been, been caught in kind of bunker mentality. So that, that's one thought that comes to mind. Um, are there any other premises that you're playing with that you think might, um, that, might that, that, you're, that you've been testing out or that you're thinking of, how do you communicate that value in, in a way that's, that's, that, that people will, will resonate with? I think that's a really important one. I think um, in terms of we're going to have to reframe what that what those field trips look like. And that's kind yes. of where we're, we're still trying to figure out what that looks like in order to still make those happen. Yeah. Well, I think, I think this, um, I would, for all of you, I would just, anytime you feel constrained um, within limitations and we always deal with constraints. And right now we have more constraints than we ever have before because so many old assumptions are breaking down. Whenever you feel constrained, you want to ask yourself, how do we tell the bigger story? It's a time to be bold. So I would encourage you of what is a bigger idea that you want to anchor to, which could be things like, look, you know, one thing we've all learned through this experience with COVID is, you know, this is having all of us think about our relationship to the world around us. Um, you know, and like, and obviously then like right size that for, for kids 
and their own educational like learning journey and what, what is the importance of how they're connecting to their local community and ecosystem. Um, I would, you know, I, this is the time to like have a point of view, like take a stand that says, this is what we think matters. And as long as it's a love story, it's positive, it's a celebration, right? That's, you know, it, it becomes difficult for people to knock you for it. Not everybody's going to say yes, but just basically give people a, you know, sort of a story worth telling something that's going to be like, oh, well, yeah, I can get behind that. That fills my cup. That's energizing. Um, you know, and, 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 and on that point, Daniel, let's go back one slide to just in summary, because this kind of, uh, yep, here we go, um, right? It's just to reinforce again, the positives, right? Positive, positive, positive. What's the feel good message, the love story? Also, this is a time to fill the communications void. How, however frequently you think you're communicating right now, there's an opportunity to probably communicate even more frequently. This is a time to hold people close, right? Solve the riddle on how do you talk about your work as essential must have? What is that value proposition or the, the case for why what you do matters? Um, this is an opportunity to strengthen that sense of belonging and sense of community, right? And this is environmental education has always been about that. You know, I talk about in the book, the most important story for solving climate change this might sound glib, but it's simply like find a place you care about and take care of it. Right? Find a place you care about and take care of it. Like that's how we solve climate change and how disconnected many people feel to their neighborhood, to their local park, to their watershed, to their city. Right. And so this is, again, these are the kinds of themes that COVID is, is, is bringing up for all of yeah. us as this new awakening of, wow, this is a time for self-reflection and, and how do we take care of each other? Um, this is a time to invite people to look at the world through fresh eyes. And lastly, this is a time to perhaps evolve your own relationship with technology that even though you're focused on the natural world, many of you, and many of you have embraced technology, but nature and technology are not polar opposites. There's actually a way that one can enhance the other. Um, and there's all sorts of ways that screens right now can help shorten the distance and bring people closer together or create more immersive learning. Um, and, and I think there's great opportunities there um, for, Michael, for everybody yeah. to take advantage of. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to all the panelists, big virtual thank you to all of you for being on and being able to have conversations. We do have several questions. So let's go okay. quickly to the ending. If you can stay on, please stay on for just a few more minutes. And then we have several questions um, that we'll answer in just a minute. So thank you, Michael, for all of that. We really appreciate all the new ideas, all the new insights and all the resources. We really appreciate it. And we are going to focus on hope and focus on the future and focus yeah. on telling a really good story. And Anne, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, unless, Michael, you have one more word for us before we go into the actual closing. Um, if I can actually just real quick, uh, Daniel, will you pull up just the, the slides just on our additional resources for everybody? Um, just want to put up that quick, yep. con quick information for everybody. Um, and everybody will get this, so don't worry. Ah, okay, great. Um, well, yeah, we just have a whole bunch of different articles that um, you may find of great value. Also, my latest book, Story 10X, you can find it on Amazon. The audiobook version also just released last week, if you prefer learning um, that way. Um, and then we are also working on um, a program this summer called The Pivot, How to Communicate a New Story. Um, and that's going to be a, a, a small group learning program. So if any of you are interested in that, uh, just type your email in the chat right now. We'll be sure to prioritize sharing more information about that. This can be a very affordable program um, that will be a 21-day process and how you can build the one-page narrative outline um, in being able to communicate that new story based on a lot of the themes that we've shared. Um, okay, so with that... Um, Thank you let's, so, so let's, much, Michael. Let's take more questions. Yeah. Yep. So, Anne, do you want to do a quick summary of kind of where this sure. is going to be so people can find it? And then we'll get back to the questions in a second. Just a, just a quick um, closing here. 
We are going to be sharing the recording and all the resources that Michael shared, all of the links. We're going to be sharing the notes, the recording, and all those slides to all of you. And you can check out all of our previously recorded webinars on EE Pro. You can find them all there. And we do have a growing list of resources for the field. We are trying to embrace this emergence that Michael just mentioned about what are some of those growing values that are emerging right now. And so many of you are saying we need resources for educators, whether these are educators that are doing online learning for the first time or parents that are homeschooling their kids for the very first time. Check it out. There's a growing list of resources all on our website. And we have an entire amazing lineup coming up in May. Judy mentioned the one coming up next week where Corazon Latino is going to be talking about how are we connecting to the Latino community in this time. And we have some two great inspirational talks coming up from Drew Lanham, poet, author, and ornithologist, one of my favorites, as well as Amy Nez. And at the end of May, Angela Park is going to be addressing some of the issues coming up around equity and inclusion at this time. So stay tuned. We are always rolling out brand new webinars almost weekly now. So we are, and we're also looking for just some new ideas for specific topics or speakers that you'd love to hear about. Stay tuned for a survey that we'll be sharing in the next couple of days just to help us design these webinars so they better suit all of you. And that's all the updates that we have. So Michael, whenever you're ready, we can go ahead and get back to some of the questions that came up in the chat box. Yes. And uh, one of those, Michael, and Anne, thank you so much. And Michael, you really are such an inspiration. Um, Elena asked um, a really good question. When you're talking about distributed leadership, how do you ask for that if you're lower on the totem pole? What's the ways you've seen organizations try and make that more um, of a of a value <laughs> in, when you don't have a yes. lot of power. Love it. Um, so so here's a, a principle that I, I preach all the time. It's called the path of least permission. <laughs> and the path of least permission is is a, is a principle to use in any kind of journey of innovation. Because remember, when you're doing innovation, you're doing something that's never been done before. It's a speculative act. There's unknowns, there's uncertainty, there's no guarantees, right? So what we want to do is we want to shorten the distance between vision or between possibility and reality. All this to say is by the path of least permission is what's the fastest, most direct way for you to make something happen that is positive, that makes a difference, that will make people feel good and look good. Because the moment you have the thing, you build the box, it's real, you create a snowball effect. It becomes harder and harder for people to stand against it. So that's my advice for you. You know, if you're from a bottoms up approach, wanting to advocate for leadership, just do it. And especially, obviously think about, are there potential unintended consequences, you know, of things that, that of, of harm that could come? Because that's gonna be, by the way, the mindset those who are um, in, in a place of, of con basically people who are in a place of responsibility and power often have a mindset of risk minimization or risk management. So as you're moving forward and being ambitious and bold, also think about how do you minimize the risks? How do you lower potential ways that think bad things could come out of whatever you're trying to champion and make happen? So if you think through those two lenses, you know, you can start to navigate a path forward and, and create, you know, what we call that undeniable story that's difficult to resist. That's great. Another question, Michael, um, from Martina yeah. was, she wondered about guideline number five. Don't you yes. need to address what is broken before you can work towards resilience? Can you skip the step? And if so, how do you skip it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm trying to remember number five was... What was it? It wasn't. Uh, I think it was. Wait a minute. Let me just go back. Give me. Or here, actually, I've got my deck. I pull up my deck here again. I thought you had those completely memorized. Are you kidding? <laughs> um, oh, language is power. Uh, okay, great. So, in the context of language is power, ask me the question again, um, Judy. So, it was the idea of do you have to fix with what's broken before you move forward? And can you skip that step? 
No, so this is this is something that people uh, that we 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 dig much deeper in our learning programs on, and this really clicks for people and is a bit of a paradigm shift. So, look, we as leaders, our job is to solve problems, to fix things, make things better. The challenge, though, is how often are we in front of an audience where we do not have shared problem definition? Or we're in front of an audience that's complicit, if not responsible for that very problem. And so if we start with the problem, what happens is people get defensive, they shut down, they, they, you know, they, they basically reject, they deflect, and we deal with those oppositional forces. So while we're all about solving problems, um, what we specialize in at Storied is how to communicate change and transformation. So by all means, go and identify the problems. And if it's something though, that's not an easy thing for everybody to consent on about the problem, now you're gonna to need to inspire, influence and persuade people. So simply what we're offering as a strategy, which is start with the thing that gets people feeling good, right? What are the possibilities, the opportunities, the promise, the potential? That's the carrot, that's the hook. And then if people are excited about that, great. Now let's talk about the obstacles that stand in the way, i.e. the problems. Yes. So this isn't making problems taboo. It's just changing the order and the sequence. Instead of minus plus, where it starts with what's wrong, you want to tell the plus minus story. That simple paradigm shift has, we get, we get feedback from people in every training program, every keynote, people start to apply that in their presentations and their meetings. And it's incredible the difference um, that it will have and how people respond to your message. Um, and it is broken down in chapter three and then also reinforced in chapter five of the book in great detail. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael. Anybody else in the panelists or Anne, any last question before we sign off? since Michael has given us so much of his time. Anything else, anybody? I wanna give a shout out to Melissa who said here, aspirational leadership while being down to earth and connected, magical combination. That, that's what we're all working, working to create, right? It's like, just, just show up with your people and there's this combination of like, we gotta be real and we can't deny, look, if, if, if you're bleeding right now as an organization, stop the bleeding, like focus on stabilizing the patient. And you got to be honest and sober about that. Right. But also understand that you're going to have to just like in a battlefield environment, you're going to have to maintain and re and re-energize morale. Right. Because otherwise we all just burn out. We got to have something to live for. So that's the context shifting we have to do it with leaders of like, we have to meet the moment, but then we have to also call people into a bigger, better future. Even when we don't have certainty about that future, great. Name the short term, name the constants, the, sort of the timeless truths. And then we go back and forth on that journey between meeting the present, looking towards the future, back to the present, back and forth. And then, by the way, bring back your past what do you have in your past that you can draw on, right? The way to think about this is how does your past legitimize your future? So this is a way, even though so many things have changed, there are assets, there are learning experiences, there's wisdom, there's things you've done from the past that you can use to say, you know what, we've been through something like this before, right? Or, you know what, we, 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 have, we have the following assets and capacity that actually we can use as we pivot and as we adapt in this new environment. Um, so that, that becomes the recombination. Yeah. So um, with that, again, I just want to invite you. people, if you want to stay in touch, the best thing to do is reach out to me via LinkedIn, Michael Margolis, Storied. You can also connect with uh, Danielle uh, Bennett Simmons, who's our Director of Strategy and Communications. Um, but feel free to connect with us at LinkedIn, on LinkedIn. Also, my email is michael at getstory.com. Um, and would love to stay connected with all of you guys. What you guys are, the work you're doing is so important and um, grateful to be a part of the community. Michael, thank you so much. Somebody just said I could listen to Michael all day and I think we all ah. could. 
so much wow. inspiration. Yeah, maybe, great maybe ideas. all of you and my mother, but thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much. And Anne, thank you and all our panelists. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Michael. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.